Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Now, Visual Basic also had a good number of changes. Actually, in this release of .NET, VB got many, many more changes than we have in C Sharp. So here, I want to kind of break down the things that Visual Basic programmers can now make use of. Really, if you already have a background in C Sharp, you've already seen this stuff before, for the most part, because um, the, the features that we got in 3.5 for C Sharp, those are pretty much the same features that VB programmers now have in 4.0. Now this one here in the middle, in red, I think this is the best, <laughs> the best part of the, uh, the language changes for VB. No more line continuation character, that little dreaded underbar that you had to have at the end of a multi-lined statement, that's gone. That alone is fantastic, <laughs> because that really simplifies how we work with the lengthy blobs of Visual Basic. So let's go ahead and kind of run through these changes here. First of all, Visual Basic now supports automatic properties, just like C Sharp. And if you're primarily a VB person, you might not know exactly what an automatic property is. So let me kind of set, set it up for you. We know that properties are just the standard way to do encapsulation of simple data, right? So over here on the left-hand side, this would be a traditional approach to wrapping up a string, which is representing somebody's first name. Now, if you only need to do this very simple encapsulation, so there's no need for any kind of fancy data validation, you're not trying to do data binding, you're not trying to write to an error log, you just simply want to get and set. Yeah, that's a fairly verbose amount of code for just a basic read-write operation. What we can now do in 4.0 is we can declare property just like this. At compile time, what will happen is we're going to get a private backing field added to our class automatically. Now, we don't see that, though. Okay, that's something we don't have direct access to in VB code. And the get in the set for the property will also be automatically implemented for you. So if you make use of this concise syntax, that means you will always have to use the property name to control the underlying data. You know, if we were to take the normal approach, or I should say the traditional approach over here, yeah, then we have options, right? If we're actually inside of the class, I could either use my own piece of private data or I could use the property. But if we use this new syntax, you can only use that property because, again, that uh, private backing field is completely hidden away. So that, that's really nice, right? We can just very quickly whip on through a whole bunch of properties. Uh, one piece which I do like a lot is over here. You can actually give that property a default assignment. And that's something that you can't do in uh, C Sharp. Now here's another nice little feature change for uh, Visual Basic. You might remember that in 3.5, VB introduced something called Object Initialization Syntax. And it was a feature which allowed you to kind of quickly set up a whole bunch of property values at the time you created the object. It was kind of similar to like the with keyword. Okay. Well, now we have an extension of that same idea and it's called collection initialization syntax. What this lets you do is populate a collection such as a generic list with a whole bunch of objects by defining a scope, right? So once again, VB has the dreaded curly bracket creeping into the language. So this is kind of like, um, you know, an alternative to calling the add method multiple times. If any of you have worked with 
array initialization syntax in VB. Same idea, except now we're not operating on just a simple array. We're working with a complex object. One bummer about this approach is that you cannot combine object and collection initialization syntax. And that's unfortunate, uh, because if we could, then we can start to write code like this. And that's exactly what you could do in C Sharp. Notice how I'm initializing the collection. And then over here, I'm trying to also initialize the objects. But unfortunately, again, that would be an error in Visual Basic. But this part up here is still pretty handy. So when you're creating your objects, you'll just have to pick an appropriate constructor. And then down here, okay, this is basically the same thing that we saw on the top, but now notice how there is no more line continuation. They're all gone. That's going to be inferred now by the actual uh, environment. So that's, that, again, is probably my favorite feature. Well, I actually lied. My real favorite feature for Visual Basic is that they have real support, complete support, for lambdas now. C Sharp was given um, lambda syntax in 3.5, and Visual Basic got a little bit of support for doing lambdas, but before we had .NET 4.0, the support was really limited. Now, before I even go down the changes, I think it's probably a good idea to just talk about lambdas in general, because I think that a lot of programmers are maybe not so sure what to do with these things. So, the thing to always keep in mind is that a lambda in any .NET language that supports them, it's really nothing more than a shorthand notation for using delegates. Okay, so if you think about the base class libraries, you know, you'll find plenty of methods that require lambdas as parameters. Oh, I'm sorry, that require delegates as parameters. So in a traditional approach, we would have to create an instance of the delegate, then create the method that it points to, and then pass in that delegate object to the method that requires it. And that's not bad, it's just a little bit verbose. So what we can do in Visual Basic, or C Sharp, is instead of defining the actual delegate object and then defining the method it points to, I can just inline a method scope right there when I would normally pass in a delegate object. So let me go back to my demos over here. So we looked at that in the previous video. And let me take a peek over here at some VB code. Okay, so let's take a look first of all at the no lambda approach. Let me try to explain what's happening here. The list, right, the good old list class. It has a particular method called find all, right? So you can see here I created a list called states and I'm calling on the list object this find all method, okay? That's been there since the list was first introduced. Now if I hover my mouse cursor over the find all method, you might be able to see in that little pop-up window that find all is asking for something called a predicate. Well, predicate is actually a delegate. It's actually a generic delegate. So if I was not going to use lambdas, look at what I would have to do. Number one, I'd have to create an instance of this predicate object. Into his constructor, I have to specify the address of the method to point to. So that little method right there, examine strings. All I'm basically doing here is I'm just going to pass in each string to the method. Well, actually, the list object will do that for me when I call find all. And I'm just going to see if, that, if the entry has a space in it. So, for example, those two. Okay, so that's what we would have to do without a lambda. And you can just see that what you kind of end up with is a whole bunch of methods like this hanging in your class that are only called under very, very limited circumstances. So now let me show you how we can do that same thing with lambdas.
For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.